Hello, my, my name is Sean, and welcome to the next episode of Holy Gaming. Hey, hello, uh, my name is Sean, and uh, welcome to the... I'm not sure what episode this is, I believe it's episode 9, I think. Uh, well, thank you for joining us for Holy Gaming. And uh, what we're going to be doing is I'm doing a new series, a uh, three-week series called uh, Torrid... Uh, a study in the book of Joel. So I'm going to be going Joel chapter 1, 2, and 3 for the next three weeks. And I'm cutting off the other series that I was doing uh, that had to do with... Um, I'm not exactly sure what it was. It was uh, I was doing a series that had to do with the Bible college and I'm in about understanding the book of Revelation and different things like that. I just felt it wasn't going that well. It was taking too much time and I just didn't feel uh, led to do it. So... Uh, what we're going to be doing is I'm going to go ahead and pray to start off uh, uh, the sermon that I taught last Saturday, Torrid. Uh, we're going to be going over chapter one. So I'm going to go ahead and pray because there's too much of a glare, so much of a glare of my glasses on here. So I'm going to go ahead and try to read this without my glasses. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and pray. Um, so... Let us gain discernment for your words, Lord. Let us understand the words of the prophet Joel and the importance of his warnings. This is not just for the land of Judah and their turning away from you. But if there is sin lurking within us, let it be taken out of let us be taken out of our comfort zone and see the error of our ways. Have our eyes point out on our own. Have our eyes point to our own failures because at best we are sinning dogs. When Joel points uh, for the inhabitants of Judah to weep and repent, let our eyes focus on the cross and focus on the importance of to understanding, uh, understanding Joel and understanding where he was coming from when being the doomsayer prophet against uh, the city of southern Judea. So... And what Jesus did for us, it is in your holy, precious name, Father, and in your Son's name, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. So, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and read from this paper, periodically look from the paper up to there to explain, uh, to explain uh, this week's sermon. Okay, so I'm going to begin this Bible study with a topic that scares a lot of us. Uh, these are books that pastors oftentimes will look over, especially the you know, the crazy pastors from the uh, prosperity movement that's been going on with Joe Olstein and, the, you know, those guys on the, you know, Day Star and things like that. Um, well, a lot of prosperity preaching, uh, they won't touch the book of Lamentations. They won't touch the book of Job. They say, you know, every Friday should be, you know, every Friday should be your Friday type of thing. You should always be happy. Um, and, you know, all paths lead to one and those types of things. So it's going to, this book goes completely against that. You know, I do believe in the Southern Baptist way of teaching that uh, I, I believe it is that every book is the living breath of God. So everything should be compared to Jesus and the teachings of Jesus, like the red letters. So I do believe in the uh, red letter Christian revolution that's been going out right now by Shane Claiborne and Tony Campolo. But I do believe that every word was inspired by the Holy Spirit and still profitable for teaching and for discernment for us as the people who uh, learn from the Bible, not just, you know, we should throw away everything else and just look at Jesus and everything's just happy-go-lucky. It's just not like that. So I'm going to go ahead and pray for that. I'm sorry, teach from that. Okay. So, so teach on the easier topics, but I got word from God to teach on this book. So basically how that worked uh, is about a week ago, I was uh, taking calls at the call center at Red Cross where I uh, do telemarketing. Uh, to get people to donate blood uh, all around the U.S. And I just asked the Lord. I was sitting at my desk and I said, Lord, if you want me to teach, after talking to my friend Josh, um, what do you want me to teach? And I heard the word Joel really loud. So I just thought, okay, Joel, I'll do three, two or three weeks on Joel. I decided on three weeks, so each week's going to be a chapter. So that's pretty much how that happened. It's about a nation, a land that has been with God, then walked away. So we get blessed, then complacent, then forget about Jesus. We walk our own way and choose the life of sin. This is the small book of Joel, the desolation that leads to restoration. 
Much like the book of Hosea, there is God's wrath and punishment, which is the removal of his blessings. And also, uh, when you see in uh, the starts off in chapter 1 and also chapter 2, and I believe a little bit in chapter 3, I'm not sure. We'll get to that bridge you know, when we get there. That God sends four different types of locusts uh, to eat up all the crops there. So, in my opinion, that's like a removal of a blessing. Because what God, well, I guess God commanded the locusts to go there to eat all the crops and cause the people to go into a starvation mode type of thing, which is a pretty, it's a pretty scary thing. So, removal of blessings, removing of food, because food is a blessing from God. So, that is what the book of Joel is about warning. The option to turn away, judgment, repentance, restoration, but also splinters of information on, on the day of the Lord. Because uh, I found out for the book of Joel, even though it's really small, um, it's actually the first excerpt in the Bible to speak of the day of judgment of God. So there's like splinters of revelation in here that was before the book of, like way, thousands of years before the book of Revelation was written. So I just learned that recently. So I would like to open up this reading with Romans chapter 14, verse 10. So if you want to go ahead and get your Bibles out or your iPhones out and flip to Romans. You can pause the video. Flip to Romans chapter 14, verse 10, which states, Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. End quote. So this small book, a part of the 12 minor prophets, book begins with the similarity of locusts that came like the plague. So now go ahead and pause the video. Go to Joel chapter 1, and I'm going to, we'll read verses 1 through 4. So pause it. Now I'm going to read it right now. So uh, Joel chapter 1. The word of the Lord came that came to Joel, son of Pethuel, an invasion of locusts. So verse 2, hear this, you elders. Uh, listen, all you who live in the land, has anything like this ever happened in your days or in the days of your ancestors? Tell it to your children and let your children tell it to their children and their children to the next generation. What the locust swarm has left, the great locusts have eaten. What the great locusts have left, the young locusts have eaten. What the young locusts have left, the other locusts have eaten. There is a parallel here, so we're going to stop right there on verse 4. So there's a parallel here. Um, the same type of plague that eats and destroys crops in the book of Exodus, Mo Moses and Aaron warn Pharaoh that he needs to let God's people go, and if this doesn't happen, God will send the locusts. So there's a complete parallel here from one of the first books of the Bible, Exodus, in the form of a plague, because this what this looks like in the book of Joel is a plague by God, because it says in, I believe, chapter 3, that God himself sends the locusts, just like in this one. Um, it was always in the form of, the war, in form of a warning in, um, in Exodus. So go ahead and flip to Exodus chapter 10, verses 3 through 6, and we'll see the parallel there. So go ahead and pause the video, and I'm going to read it right now. Okay. So, it's, um, so verse 3, So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said to him, This is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, says, How long will you refuse to humble yourselves before me? Let my people go. So the famous quote right there from all the movies you've seen in the movie back in the 1950s. That's what every, even all the kids know that one, let my people go. Okay, so that they may worship me. If you refuse to let them go, I will bring locusts into your country tomorrow. They will cover the face of the ground so that it cannot be seen. They will devour what little you have left after the hail, including every tree that is growing in your fields. Verse 6. They will fill your houses and those of all your officials. They will fill your houses and those of all your officials and all the Egyptians. Uh, something neither your parents nor your ancestors have ever seen uh, the day that they settled in this land till now. So... Okay, so end quote. That was verse 6. Then Moses turned and left Pharaoh. So, okay, so that was the parallel right there. So, I want us to have the discernment that even though God is a God of judgment, he is also the God of love. And this one's a really confusing one. I put more of an emphasis on it for next week. So, if you're one of those kind of types that didn't really get the sermon, uh, a pastor or a friend uh, never talked to you about uh, the differences between god's wrath and then but god's love at the same at the same time especially hell because a lot of christians don't believe in hell you know and also the other factions that don't believe in hell i uh, go in, in a little bit more in that next week so um 
even though God is a God of judgment and a God of love. When plagues were poured out, it was to have the persons or people to turn from their sinful ways and to see that Jesus is their God and that he loves them. So it's also in the form of, in my opinion, from what I've read in a Rob Bell book, I think it was in that book, Sex God, that he wrote. Um, it's like you're in a relationship with God, but you worshiping other idols. You're, you know, it's like in a relationship where a man loves a woman, but the man is creating infidelity in their relationship, you know, especially in the marriage, because that's the most important parts of the marriage. That's you know, like you're cheating on God, you know, from worshiping the other idols, doing what you're doing, you know, don't care about your path, you know, type of thing. So the desolation always moves into restoration. So let's look at for a while, for a little bit, the locusts that destroy crops and cause famine. So Wikipedia describes them as, and this is in quote on the first page of Wikipedia about what locusts are and what they do. So are the swarming phase of certain species of short-horned grasshoppers in the family Acridati? Uh, I don't know. You'll have to look that one up. Acridati and you know, look at a Bible dictionary. No. Dictionary.com. These are species that can breed rapidly under the suitable conditions and subsequently become gargantuous and migratory when their populations become dense enough. So they form uh, bands as nymphs and swarms as adults, but the bands that the swarms are nomadic and rapidly strip fields and greatly damage crops. The adults are powerful flyers. They can travel great distances, consuming practically all green material whenever the swarm settles. So, end quote from Wikipedia. Okay, this is bad. So, have you ever watched any of those bug documentaries on Animal Planets of the Story of Exodus or the Story of Exodus on the History Channel? You know, if they're not talking crap about God in that one. But if you see the swarms in action, you'll see that it's pretty devastating. Uh, the beginning of Joel is the understanding of personal sin and, the, and personal error. So, in the story, God has given enough chances to Judah. So Southern Judah, uh, a lot of theologians believe that because there's not that much information in Joel, uh, the thing that they do think it was about of what area he was speaking to was Southern Judah and that they turned their eyes from God and doing pretty much what every generation was doing back in the Old Testament days and even, even now is looking away from God and God, you know, sent the plague to, you know, it's like the harsh reality of what, you know, God did to get to these people's hearts because their hearts, I mean, it seems like it's, you know, their hearts have been ridiculously hard, but, um, okay. So giving enough chances to Judah, it states on insight.org. So I looked this one up about the theme of Joel, which states, and so this is a quote for insight.org. The book focuses its prophetic judgment on the Southern kingdom of Judah when frequent references to Zion and the temple worship. Okay, so it's a little confusing, but go ahead and look that one up if you want to. Um, so we're going to go back to Joel chapter 1, read verses 5 through 12. Okay, so pause the video. Okay, now I'm going to read it. So verse 5, wake up, you drunkards, and weep. Wail, all you drinkers of wine. Wail because of the new wine, for it has been snatched from your lips. A nation has invaded my land, a mighty army without number. It has the teeth of a lion, the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vines and ruined my fig trees. It has stripped off their bark and thrown it away, leaving their branches white. Mourn like a virgin in satch cloth, grieving for the betroth of her youth. Um, grain offerings and drink offerings are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests are in mourning. So those who minister before the land, uh, the fields are ruined, verse 10. The fields are ruined and the ground is dried up. The grain is destroyed. The new wine is dried up. The olive trees have failed. Despair, you farmers. Wail, you vine growers. Grieve for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field is destroyed. The vine is dried up and the fig tree is withered. The pomegranate, the palm, and the apple trees, all the trees of the field are dried up. Surely the people's joy is withered away. So it, it had to get pretty, pretty intense. In order for the, you know this kind of stuff to happen, for God to just take away that much, it, it had to have been like an entire generation of the people that were living there were just like the thing of, in Lot's day in the book of Genesis, just no one cared, you know, and God wanted to get to these people's hearts. So, so the book of Joel is pretty similar to the story of Hosea. Um, God pours out His wrath and punishment on the land in the form of removed blessings, or you know. 
him sending the plague, however you want to look at it. Um, this leads the people, especially the priests, to put on sackcloth and weep. But after this period, they go into a repentance time, then into God's restoration to his people and his land. Put that right there. Okay, so now we're going to read verses 13 through 15. Pause the video. Okay. Verse 13, put on sackcloth, you priests, and mourn. Will you, um, you who minister before the altar, uh, come spread the night in sackcloth, you who minister before my God. For the grain offerings and drink offerings are withheld from the house of your God. 14, declare a holy fast, call a sacred assembly, summon the elders, and all who live in the land to the house of the Lord your God, and cry out to the Lord. Verse 15, alas for that day. For the day of the Lord is near, it will come like destruction from the Almighty. End right there. So, um, so coming straight. To, okay, so before we finish up on uh, chapter one, <clears throat> I would like to read an excerpt I read also on Insight.org um, on the summary and importance of the book of Joel. So I feel that um, just keep uh, just keep this in mind when. Uh, for the other videos that you see for the next two weeks. So just keep this part in mind. Um, this was written by a man named Robert B. Uh, Chris Holm Jr., which states in, in his quote on the website, the book of Joel's importance to the canon of scripture stems from its being the first to develop an oft-mentioned biblical ideal, which is uh, the day of the Lord, or also known as Judgment Day. Um, so, uh, lost my place. Um, while Obadiah, the other book in the Old Testament, mentioned the terrifying event in verse 15, uh, which also states, if you want to flip to Obadiah, so pause the video if you want, to chapter 1, verse 15. It states that the day of the Lord is near for all nations. As you have done it, it will be done unto you. Your deeds will return upon your own head. So, end quote. Um, Joel's book gives some of the most striking and specific detail in all of scripture about the day of judgment. Days cloaked in darkness, armies that conquer like consuming fire, and the moon turning blood red. Um, rooted in such violent and physical imagery, this time of ultimate judgment still in the future is still into the future, and we are still waiting for it's about to happen. So the second coming of Christ, pretty much, and all the because uh, a lot of pastors right now, especially in the Calvary movement, from what I've seen going to their Bible studies in Tucson, they believe that. Uh, we are in the birthing pains right now. That the day of judgment is pretty close. They don't. There's no specific time. Because only the Father knows the specific time and specific specific day. But uh, they believe we're in the birthing pains right now. That's why all the crazy stuff is going on for like the last like 10 to 20 years. Okay, so um, you can find this also in Second Thessalonians. You don't have to flip there if you don't want to. Second Thessalonians chapter two verse two, and Second Peter chapter three verse ten. So these verses also make clear the seriousness of God's judgment on sin. So now we're going to read uh, verse 16 to 20. So, okay. Verse 16, has not the food been cut off before our very eyes, joying gladness from the house of our God? Uh, the seeds are shriveled beneath the clods. The storehouses are in ruins. The, graninar the graninaries have been broken down. I have to look that up. I'm not sure what that is. Um, for the grain is dried up. How the cattle moan, uh, the herds mill about because they have no pasture, even the flocks of sheep are suffering. Uh, in verse 19, to you, Lord, a call uh, for fire has devoured the pastures in the wilderness and flames have burned up all the trees of the field. Verse 20, even the wild animals pants for you. The streams of water have dried up and the fire has devoured the pastures in the wilderness. End quote. So the reading, so this reading is a bit bleak. But I honestly believe that all scripture, like I said a second ago, all scripture is the living breath of God and all scripture is profitable. Not for you to, in the way of profitable, I mean, I mean, uh, when, you know, if you go back to Leviticus and I think there's one verse where it's talking about, um, you know, if a woman, if a wife sees her husband fighting another man um, in a state of wrath or something like that, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure that if she grabs the you know, the testicles of the man who was beating on her husband. Um, she has defiled her hand and then has to cut off her own hand, like something from like the Quran or something like that. Um, so, uh, no, not in that context, but no, this is, I do feel that led 
to say in this video, whoever's going to watch it, this is serious. This is not like a happy-go-lucky type of thing, even though I'm going to be talking about Jesus' um, restoration for us and the hope and the forgiveness and the love that he has for us. Um, it's also a mixture of God has wrath against sin and hates sin and the sin that we commit and the sin that we delve into, I'm sure all of us do, you know, on a daily basis. God hates all of that. And this is, you know, this is in the Bible for a reason, okay? It's not just a thing where, oh, we're reading this one just for study purposes. So, okay. So the point of these letters and books, like the book of Revelation, for example, is for gaining knowledge and breaking spiritual stupors, is what I believe and what I also found on Insight. So, sorry, I'm running out of breath. Like, I need to go get a drink. Okay, so God's love is just as real as his wrath against sin. This places fear into us to give us that awakening, that fear of God to break out of the regular delving of sin or the ones who are stuck in one place. Um, Robert B. Chris Holm Jr. also states that apocalyptic imagery can shimmy Christians out of their quicksand complacency, but the basis for this should always be Jesus and his redemption through the changing nature of the Holy Spirit. So pray about it. Um, with these letters and books, we can become confused about the convictions of sin and make our lives work based so God doesn't stay mad at us. But this, uh, from what I have learned, is wrong. So just that's a pharisaical way of thinking. That's what I learned is wrong. You know, you're telling somebody over and over again, you see them gossiping, and then the next week you see them gossiping again. It's like, well, I told them. Now I'm going to base my scripture, what I'm going to teach, around the fact that that specific person's gossiping. And then three weeks later, you know, they stop for a little while, but then they're gossiping again. It's just like, well, I'm not going to teach anymore because they're not listening. That's, that's my confusion. That's, I'm sure it's a confusion of a lot of people, but that's a thing where um, it's a pharisaical way of teaching, you know, the whole, I got to wash my hands before I eat, you know, because, you know, it's like a Mormon way of thinking type of thing, or, you know, a, a, you know one of the super Catholic type of things. It's not good. So, um, let's see. It's about your relationship with Jesus and how he and now he can give you that desire to walk away from sin, honestly feeling a change and the workings with your strongholds from, you know, the Holy Spirit. So pray to Jesus about what he wants from you and what he wants to change because anything is possible with him. And I'm going to end on this. So go ahead. So I'm going to end with this Bible study on Matthew. So everyone go ahead and flip to chapter Night, Matthew chapter 19, verses 25 through 26. I'm going to read it right now. Okay, so 25. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, Who then can be saved? So Jesus looked at them and said, What with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. So, and that's the end of the sermon. So we're going to have three, I always have three study questions uh, that I've taken from my pastor that I learned from Pastor uh, Awesome, one of the best pastors I've ever known and worked under, um, you know, without pay. Uh, what was his name? Pastor Joe Kosky, I believe he teaches. He teaches in somewhere in Seattle now. But when in California, he always had study-based questions. Um, after the sermons, he would teach at Ichthus or in Soma, the college groups in California. So uh, they're called the hot questions. I used to call them hot topic questions, but I got really tired of that because I. I don't even like hot topics. Proposers. So, question number one. Hot question number one. So, just mold this over. This is what you do every week. Just wrestle with it. Think about it. I think about these questions. I think about the questions I write in the car driving to work. So, when reading the first chapter of Joel, it's good to keep in mind what Jesus did on the cross. In your opinion, what is the difference between works-based faith and faith-based living? Question two, like the book of Exodus, locusts were used to cause a plague against Egypt. What do you think the point was to send this plague of God, to, for him to send the plague against Pharaoh and against Judah? So Pharaoh and then Judah in the book of Joel. And question three, the mole over. I mentioned that Joel is similar to Hosea, the book of Hosea. Hosea went after a prostitute, Gomer, that he married over and over to bring her back home, even though she kept leaving to sin. She kept cheating on him, you know. So how do you feel this relates to having your relationship with Jesus and how Jesus uh, um, does these things with you? So how do you feel it relates? 
So I'm going to go ahead and end the video there. If you have any questions or you want me to pray about something or, you know, whatever, uh, go ahead and leave me a message, leave me a comment, or go on Facebook, Sean Stuckey, Facebook, and ask a question or, you know, whatever. So thank you for watching. This was uh, Chapter 1. Next week's going to be Chapter 2. Thank you for watching Holy Gaming, Episode 8 or 9. I'm not sure.